Testament reading comes from the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 6 through 7 and 10 through 15. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour, with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, they hate him who approves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. And for I know how many you are, trans how many your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and who and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Today's epistle comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, where, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Again, this is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter, where Jesus teaches us both about what is good and what is worth treasuring. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Our text for today, uh, uh, we continue to track through the book of Mark, um, and this is actually going to be the last week we're going to continue through Mark like this, because next week, as we roll out our definition, we'll be beginning a sermon series based around that specific, uh, that specific uh, sentence, mission statement that we come out with. It'll be a four-week series, and so we'll conclude uh, the Gospel of Mark 10 here with verses 17 22. Listen again to these words from Jesus. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be ever pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. So for our, to track with our sermon today, we're going to be using the framework of this very text. So I invite you to have the sheet in front of you. Uh, we're just going to, we're going to track through using verse by verse. So I'm going to start at 17. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A few things about this man. Uh, this text appears also in Matthew and Luke. 
and we learn a little more about him. Number one, we learn, no, he's a man. Number two, we learn that he is a young man. We actually get this uh, later on down the text where it says he's young. But then we also get, we also learn in Luke that he's wealthy. Not only, well, not just, not, not Luke, sorry. We learn that he is a ruler in Luke. We learn that he has authority, he has power, he has influence. And then here, based on our last verse, we discover that he's wealthy, that he has great possessions. So if I wanted to be, you know, like a social media influencer or somebody like that, I mean, this is the guy I want to be. I have, I have money, I have power, and I'm young. So I got a lot of time to have that money and power. So that's great. The man is running up to Jesus because Jesus is about to take off. And you'll notice he sees Jesus as greater because the first thing he does is he kneels to Jesus. That's a sign of respect, a sign that there is something about Jesus, even if he's not a ruler above him in this guy's mind, there's something about him that makes him greater, greater in wisdom, greater in knowledge, something. Then he asks the question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good teacher. Now, the question I'm not going to ask is, does this guy know that he's talking to God? This guy, however, thinks he knows what good is. How do you define good? The thing is, we, if I were to ask anybody that in the whole world, I could ask people in this room or anywhere, we would all have a different definition of good. However, we would find a lot of crossover. And a lot of our crossover would be things from the Ten Commandments. You shouldn't steal. Good people don't steal. Good people are nice. Good people are selfless. Good people also take care of others. They give wealth away. They're kind. So you, you got all these things that would make someone good. Now, if we look at how this man is thinking, and we're going to discover why, this man Based on the question he's asking, he is thinking something that is actually true. He is thinking a, something that's conceptually true, that good people go to heaven. He believes that good people go to heaven. And again, that statement in itself is true. The thing is, for this man, he believes that he's one of those good people. And so he's looking for affirmation from God. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Next verse, verse 18. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Well, one, we see Jesus' response here. You know, I imagine since this man, well, he knows the Ten Commandments. He's probably Jewish also. He has a good understanding of what good means. He actually seems to have a concept of it. And Jesus would probably affirm some of that definition. But there's a, a, a key problem here. Number one, Jesus said nobody's good except God alone. And if this man really knew his Bible, his Hebrew Bible, he could have gone back to Psalm 51 verse 5 and read that in sin did my mother conceive me. He could go to Romans 3, 23, where Paul, well, that wasn't written yet, but he could still find ideas that say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He could go to Genesis 9 and see the wickedness of the world. All people are wicked. But he still thought he was good. So it is true that good people go to heaven, but the problem is that nobody's good except God alone. Martin Luther affirms this. St. Augustine affirms this. You find a lot of people who affirm that this is true, but yet I look around the world today and I find so many people that think they are good people. Let's go back to, uh, to social media. You know, if I look at the world we're in today, I once heard this defined in a peer review article, and I think it is the best definition ever for how our world is today. It's called moral narcissism. It's this idea that I am a good person. Why? Because I affirm the morals that our society wants us to believe. And I get approval, I get likes, I get retweets, I get shares, all because 
I make myself look like a good person. I share in those beliefs. Whatever that is, of course, I am a good person. Well, Jesus, again, speaks at the sat and says, well, there is nobody good but God alone. Let's go forward a little bit and let's go on to verse 19. Jesus decides to play along with the man's train of thought. Okay, let's pretend you're good. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And then verse 20. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. So, Ten Commandments, Jesus lists off several of them here. They're all commandments, and you know, for, you know, just for the sake of our, our text here, let's pretend that the guy really did keep all of those commandments Jesus listed off from his youth. Let's pretend that he was a really good person in that way, probably better than most of his peers. That'd be pretty cool. Okay, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt and say he is. Jesus doesn't list all the commandments, though. He's missing a few. Because you'll notice in these commandments that Jesus lists, these all have to do with your interactions with your neighbor. Jesus didn't list any of the ones that talk about your interactions with God. The first commandment, and I'll ask all of you, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. There was a problem here. This man wasn't following the first commandment. He got all the ones down with his neighbor, but he forgot the most important relationship. And this then goes to the next half of this story, or the next side of the story where we talk about treasure. The things that matter, the things that are important. Clearly, we look in verse 20, this guy had a lot of wealth. He, was, he had many, many possessions, whatever those were. I don't know. They didn't have Ferraris back in the day. Maybe he would have had Ferraris if we were in our day and age. He would have had Lamborghinis. He would have had a massive house. He probably had really cool house parties. I don't know. But he was somebody that other people probably wanted to be. And we know just from reading this that he treasured his wealth. He treasured his possessions. He treasured the things he had. Where Jesus then wants to reorient him. And I love how Jesus does this. I'm going to look at uh, verse 21. And Jesus, looking at him, get this. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, so all that you have. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come Follow me. I love how that begins. It said Jesus loved him. He agaped him is actually the Greek. It means a charitable, selfless love. A love. It's one that, you know, you care so much about that person. You're willing to give it all. And what was Jesus' loving response? It wasn't what the man wanted to hear. You see, the man wanted to be affirmed in his way of life. He had all this treasure. He had all these possessions. He probably had everything he ever wanted. But he still asked the question because there was something gnawing at him. He needed that affirmation that eternal life was really his, even though he thought he was a good person that deserved it. He needed that affirmation, but Jesus didn't give it. Why? Because he loved him. Because the truth is, when you love somebody, sometimes it's not affirmation. Sometimes it's not tolerance. We aren't supposed to tolerate the things that turn us away from God. And yes, we live in a world that constantly says, if you're a good person, you tolerate people doing whatever they want to do. But see, if you're tolerating some of those sinful behaviors that people want to do, what it really is, it's either it's fear on your part, that you might get canceled, or it's an apathy because you don't care. That's not love. The opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is apathy. Jesus was not apathetic. Jesus was loving. 
And he loved this man too much to keep letting him go down a sinful life path choice. He wanted a relationship with him. And he knew that his wealth, in this man's instance, his possessions, the things he was treasuring, was keeping him from that. This man treasured his wealth. Well, what do I mean when I say treasure? I'll give you an example. So back in 2020, uh, I had a lease and uh, my car lease was about to go up. I need to get a car. So I did all my research and I actually got that, uh, that Ford uh, Escape out there, the current one that I have. And Got it used, got a really good deal on it. It was like a day before Wisconsin shut down, so I got a really good deal on it. Uh, very proud of that deal, actually. But once I got that car, I fell in love with that car. I always wanted to be doing work on it. Remember, it was a used car, so I needed to take care of it. It had little dings in it. I'm talking about these little things you'd never notice unless you got close, you know. And uh, so I bought some paint, and I went out and tried to go clean up all those little dings, and uh, there was the, the, the part of the metal was bent in, so I opened up the hole inside the car and so I could bang that thing out, even though nobody would have ever noticed. Um, I spent so much time, so much of my energy, so much of my hope in that car that fixing that thing would bring me true satisfaction, would bring me true joy. Would, that was the place where I needed to be. And then finally, one day, Bridget loved me. And she said, you know, Chris, sometimes I think you treasure that car more than you treasure me. And why did she do that? Because she loved me. She didn't give me an affirmation of what I was doing. It's because I made that car all of my focus. It was my priority. It was my time. I was caring for it in ways that I should have been caring for my wife. That was my treasure. What is your treasure? What is that thing that your mind is just always so wrapped around that you feel that this is the true source of satisfaction? This is the thing. This is the person. This is the idea that will bring me real, true, worldly joy. What is that? We all have one for this man. It was all his possessions. He was so wrapped up in them. He thought he would find satisfaction in stuff, in having but the reality is he wouldn't admit to it. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons he was seeking Jesus out. He wasn't satisfied. He wasn't truly joyful. Yeah, there was some temporal joy brought in getting that stuff, but it wasn't ever enough. Jesus knew the solution was getting rid of that thing that was hurting that relationship. We look at our own treasure. Now, I look at this and I think, you know, the moral of the story, Jesus isn't necessarily telling me I need to now go sell my car and give it to the poor. I mean, maybe I need to. Maybe some of us look at our treasures and we need to. But that's not the point. The point is, who am I treasuring? Is, or what am I treasuring? And if it's not God, I got my heart in the wrong place. Jesus wants us to treasure him. He wants us. He wants to be the number one in our, for us. He wants us to Make him the priority to focus wholeheartedly on him, to love the Lord your God with all your mind and your heart and your soul. That's the greatest commandment. Because when we treasure God, then we learn how to do the other commandments. Then we learn. I, would, I learn how to love Bridget. Then I learn how to love my neighbor. Then I learn how to put my car in its proper place. I learn how to treat it as a car. You see, our priorities get out of order. <clears throat> so I ask you, and this is something for you to talk about on your car ride home, and I'd like you to have this conversation when you go home today. Number one, what are the things that I am treasuring, or the people, or the ideas, or my time? What am I treasuring? And then I want to ask a second question, and this one you don't have to answer out loud, you can. Is it really satisfying? Is it really bringing me the joy that I am hoping for? Is it going to be the source of that? Well, if it's temporal joy, you can say yes, but if you're hoping it'll bring long-term joy, that's going to be the solution, it won't. So here's your third question. This is the one I want you to pray over. If I put Jesus as my first treasure, 
How is that going to cause me to reprioritize everything else I treasure? What is that going to look like? You know, I put a lot more dings in my car recently, and I've been meaning to get to them, but uh, I'll get to it later. Uh, the thing is, you realize that when your priorities are, when, you, when you're treasuring the wrong thing, God goes second. Last thing I want to say, and this is the very end, it says that the disheartened by the saying, the man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You know, the story doesn't end well. Most, like most of the ones we've been reading, it hasn't ended well. The man goes away angry. Somebody didn't get healed. There was no miracle. Nobody's rejoicing in God. It was sorrowful. And sometimes God leaves us in that uncomfortable conviction. He leaves us in that uncomfortable place because he wants us to be uncomfortable with the choices we make sometimes. But I know this. Let me show you what real treasure looks like and how Jesus does that for us. Very beginning of the story, what did Jesus do? He was on his way out the door. He could have just brushed that man aside, but he stopped. He turned. He listened. He interacted. And he loved the man. Jesus was willing to give up all the other important things he had going on, probably more important than this man, to be honest. He did it for him. And Jesus loved that man so much that he told him the hard, uncomfortable truth that maybe this man, we don't know, hopefully he came to faith, but he may have never wanted to talk to Jesus again after that. He loved him. But Jesus, I'm sure, when he went up on that cross, Jesus had his treasure right in front of him. He was thinking of that man. He was thinking of all of those people down there shouting, crucify him, all those people mocking him. He was thinking of his disciples. He was thinking of you. You're his treasure. And he has promised that there is a treasure in heaven for you. And even though we have these amazing worldly things, as long as we are treasuring Jesus, we can enjoy those worldly things for what they are. But not only that, we can use them for God's glory in how we spend our money, how we give our time, how we value what we need to. Because you are treasured. Because he is good. Amen.